So probably all of you know, this is the <clears throat> in, inaugural lecture that's honoring Grace Wava. Grace Wava is one of the outstanding statisticians of our age. She has transformed the fields of mathematical statistics and applied statistics. Her reproducing kernel Hilbert space theory plays a central role in non-parametric smoothing splines <clears throat> and its importance is widely recognized. In addition, Wava's contributions straddle the boundary between statistics and optimization and have led to fundamental breakthroughs in machine learning for solving problems arising in prediction, classification, and cross-validation. Over the years, Grace has pursued her passion for research driven by real problems and let natural curiosity be her guide. This led to groundbreaking, a groundbreaking career in statistics at a time when the odds of a woman earning international acclaim in the field were slim, to say the least. In establishing the IMS Grace Waba Award and Lecture, the IMS further affirms its commitment to honoring outstanding statisticians, regardless of gender, to supporting diversity in statistical science and its membership, and to inspiring statisticians, mathematicians, computer science, scientists, scientific researchers in, in general. Okay. Um, let me tell you a little bit about our, our speaker. Um, and, and, and I should say that my philosophy in all of this is to do things as short as possible, get out of the way, let the speaker, um, let's listen to what, what they have to say. Okay, um, however, um, we have Professor Jordan here today. Michael Jordan is the Pihong Chen Distinguished Professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering, Computer Science, and the Department of Statistics at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, straddling those departments, it's, it's fitting in terms of Grace's multidisciplinary um, career. His research in interests bridge the computational, statistical, cognitive, biological, and social sciences. Professor Jordan is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, a member of the National Academy of Engineering, a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a foreign member of the Royal Society. He was the plenary lecturer at the International Congress of Mathematicians in 2018. He's received the Ulf Grenander Prize, the John von Neumann Medal in 2020, <clears throat> um, the IJCA, CAI Research Excellence Award, the Rummelhart Prize, the um, Alan Newell Award, um, <clears throat> and we're, we're delighted to have him today. Um, today we're gonna hear about, um, I have here inferential thinking, computational thinking, and economic thinking. However, I think the update is on blending statistical machine learning and micro <clears throat> microeconomics. So please come up. <clears throat> So, um, <laughs> <laughs> All right, so thanks. Let me jump right in. Um, I want to say that I'm delighted and honored to be associated with Grace uh, in, in this way. Um, the, the committee that uh, uh, nominated me um, may not have known, but uh, I really have a real debt to pay to, uh, to, to, to Grace. Uh, when I was trying to decide, well, I was becoming a professional statistician from being an amateur back in the 1990s. Um, I was wondering whether the stat community would welcome me or, or, or not. 
And Grace was one of the people who kind of reached out and made it clear that statistics could be my home and uh, actively uh, you know, made a friendship. So she invited me to Wisconsin on at least two occasions. We got to meet her group, which felt like a family. I somewhat have modeled my own family on hers over the years <laughs> and uh, gave talks and learned about her research and just felt a really wonderful, warm connection. Um, in, in the same breath, let me mention also Larry Brown, who did the same thing, and Peter Bickle. Those are three of the names, many people, but those people made it clear that statistics has really, you know, not only super intelligent, creative people in it, but, you know, very warm people who, who um, you know, form this community. So thank you, Grace. Um, all right, so uh, titled be, Beware, um, let's, let's see if I can go ahead and start here. This slide is a little infographic that may summarize my talk. Uh, you can take it away. So I do believe that we're in an era where disciplines have to kind of come back together. Um, this is kind of an academic looking diagram, um, but it's not just about academic fields, it's real world problems. So real world problems demand large scale computing networks. They certainly demand inference and decision making. And as I'm gonna get into this talk, they demand economic thinking, incentives, and uh, thinking about groups and people coming together with algorithms and so on and so forth. Um, now, there are pairwise interactions between all these fields historically. I've given the names there. Like machine learning really is just statistics meets computation, computer science or optimization, if you will. Um, and economics is blended, of course, with statistics and that's, that's econometrics. But econometrics is sort of about measuring the economy, mostly in the service of macro. Um, it's not so much about mechanism design and statistical data, okay, uh, at, at in, the, you know, in the design of, of uh, mechanisms. Um, similarly, economics is met computer science. That's called algorithmic game theory. It has its own conferences. It's a thing. Uh, it's all about algorithms and matchings and graphs and so on and so forth. There's almost no inference in it. Um, and then I would argue that machine learning doesn't have very much mechanism design. In it. Not much talk about incentives and agents who are self-interested and so on and so forth. In the real world, you have to bring all these things, three things together because you have data out there and people possess the data. They may not want to just give you the data. They might want to be involved in an economy. Am I having? Okay, that's on that screen. Yeah. Okay. When he pushes it, it works. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit more about what machine learning is. After like 30 years of being called a machine learning researcher, I kind of finally figured out what it is. At the very end of the talk, I'm going to give you my view. Um, but let me just say it has at least two parts to it. There's pattern recognition or non-parametric statistics, if you will. And then there's decision-making. And, and you know, the hype of the last 10 years has all been about the pattern recognition side, the large scale neural networks and so on and so forth. But if you go out in the real world and you don't think about the decision-making side, you're gonna make a big mess of things. And you're gonna have systems that don't work and cause trouble and don't lead to economic value. And that's pretty much what's happened. This last wave of hype hasn't led to a lot of economic value. And I have an article with an economist arguing that. Um, so let's talk about decision-making just a little bit. Um, this slide kind of summarizes the points I wanna make, but I, to, to make it concrete, imagine you're going in to make a real world decision that's consequential, like you're visiting the doctor and the doctor's measuring all sorts of things about your body, covariance, you know, 100,000 dimensional covariate vector, including your genome. And it goes into a huge predictive engine, the world's largest big, big neural, neural net. It's been traded on all the world's hospital data and patient data and so on. So it's really good at making predictions, right? Are you gonna trust it to kind of make your medical decisions? And the answer is, you know, definitely not. Uh, as soon as you get a result that's over some threshold, you're gonna ask things about what, what's your error bar on that? What's your uncertainty, really? What's the provenance of the data that led to that prediction? Is it data that's 10 years old? Or is it recent data? Is it from you know, people like me? Or is it on the same machine that was used for me and so on and so forth? Uh, that's real world stuff. And that leads to uncertainty. And if you don't quantify all that, you're, you're gonna make a decision that you don't really have trust in. You're not gonna do that. And you're also gonna say to your doctor, hey, I forgot to tell you, but you know, my parents had heart disease or, or when I was a kid, I had asthma or what if I were to exercise more or change my diet or this or that. You have a whole dialogue that involves lots of counterfactual arguments lots of other data that seemed relevant now that didn't seem relevant before. And you realize this big predictive black box could not have contained all the world's medical data relevant to any particular decision. Just not, that's not how reasoning works. That's not how human decision making works. When you condition on a particular outcome in a particular setting, all kinds of other things become relevant that weren't relevant before. That's real decision making. And that's just for one decision. I'm making lots of decisions today over you know span of minutes or hours or, or months. You're making decisions and all of our decisions are interacting. 
And that is becoming more and more the case. Our transportation decisions interact, our commerce decisions interact, our financial decisions interact, our healthcare decisions interact. And what we're really doing in the real world is designing large scale statistical systems that don't just do a little piece of a prediction job, but they actually manage that big flow of decision-making and values and you know, data across networks that relate human beings to outcomes. Okay? And thinking at that level, I think is the level we start to have to think about. So that's really what my talk is about. So to make this still more concrete, this is a little thought experiment that helped kind of move me in this direction a few years ago. Um, recommendation systems, you all know what they are. They have led the gains in productivity. Amazon and LinkedIn and all these places use them, make recommendations to people based on a big matrix factorization. And um, you know, people buy more books or, 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 or watch more movies and so on and so forth. Uh, so it's led to billion dollar industry. It's become a commodity. You could download software. It'll run at massive scale. And there's lots of companies whose business model is to do recommendations for some domain. And if you followed this over the last few years, you've seen lots of failures. And I wanna highlight how simple it is to think about these failures. So imagine that I'm Amazon and I'm recommending books and my, my system starts to take off. A lot of people start to use it, millions or tens of millions. You know, that's great. Well, for each person, I make a recommendation of some books. And I can't do that in any linked way over a million people. So I just do it independently for each individual based on the historical data, the prediction, okay? So there's a good chance I'm gonna recommend the same book to you know, 100,000 people on a, any given day. And that happens all the time. Is that a problem? Well, no, there's no scarcity in the world of books. You can copy books, print on demand very quickly. And uh, movies, do I, if I recommend the same movie to 100,000 people, is that a problem? No, okay. So the computer science people were living in this world of no scarcity and thinking, oh, I can copy the bits as much as I want and that's fine. I don't have to worry about anything else, all right. When I first went to China, well, not first went, when I went to China about five years ago, I saw that a company had built a recommendation system using the same algorithms, the same software for, rec for restaurants, All right, That sounded kind of great, you know, because restaurants are hard to find. You can't type good restaurant in Shanghai into Google and get any, you know, thing reasonable or the, uh, or Baidu. Um, all right, so I thought, okay, great, I'll try it out. Of course, it was pretty, pr pretty bad, um, but it was being used by a small set of people in, in Shanghai and suddenly it became more popular and lots of people started using it. And there, there's your problem. As soon as lots of people started using it, it would send 10,000 people to the same restaurant. Okay, all right. And you probably heard about like, you know, the, the, the route finding things, the, the fastest route to the airport. Everyone wants to know what that is, right? So if you make a recommendation of that route to a lot of people, they all go down that route and you've created congestion. All right, these are little kind of cute anecdotes, but I hope that you get the sense that there's a real problem here. This is scarcity. This is what the economists spend their life worrying about, is how to allocate in situations of scarcity. And the computer scientists behind this said, okay, we're creating a problem. We have to fix this. So how do we fix this? Well, it's just a load balancing problem, okay? Well, it's not really, it is sort of, but who gets to go to the restaurant or who gets to go down the fast road? Zuckerberg decides. And, and the Zuckerberg mentality is so, off here, Zuckerberg mentality is that because I know you from your browsing history so well, I can target ads to you, I know you so well, I can figure out which restaurant you really wanna to go to. So I'm gonna decide and therefore I'm gonna balance and everything will be fine. Okay, if you're an economist at all, you sort of realize the stupidity. I don't know what restaurant I wanna to go to in the moment. And certainly my browsing history is not gonna tell you what restaurant to send me to. There's utilities and there's in the moment decisions, there's a free flow and also what street do I wanna go into? It depends on various things. So we wanna feel like we're in this kind of fluid decision-making system, not based locked into past predictions from past data and some algorithm that decides. So that's an economy and that's a market. And it's a market structured by large scale data. And that's something the economists do not think about. So they think about large data in the domain of macroeconomics, okay. but they don't think about it in mechanism design. So there's a huge opportunity for statistics is to become a partner in the world of mechanism design. Okay, so that's what my talk is about. Um, let me just sort of finish up on this little argument. The alternative here is not to create a recommendation system, but to create a two-way market. And on one side are producers, the other side are consumers, diners and restaurants, or riders and drivers. And it's a two-way market. And it's structured not by known preferences as in classical um, microeconomics. It's structured by learned preferences as people experience the world. Statistics, data, okay? So that's, that's new. Um, I do want to mention that I've been involved in this in the real world, because I suggest this is not just an academic argument here. Um, the music world um, is broken 
and it's shocking to say this, but you know, more people are listening to music now before than ever in history by a factor of a hundred and more people are making music bef than before by a factor of a thousand. And the amazing thing is if you look at the data uh, of all the music being listened to today in the world, 95% of the music was written in the last six months and written by people you never heard of. Okay, so everyone thinks everyone's listening to the Beatles or Beyonce or whatever. No, it's just not true. And it's mostly 16 to 18 year olds who are creating all this cultural ferment and these wonderful creative things and listening to it and sharing it. And, and so you think there's a wonderful economy there. They're making money and they have a job and it's a career. No, zero. All right, so what happens is they upload their songs. They build, do it on a laptop. They're really good at it. They upload it to some site, Spotify or whoever takes the music from that site and streams it to people, right? And no money is being talked about throughout that entire pipeline. So what Spotify does, is they sell subscriptions to the people listening. The people who made the music are cut out. Spotify then makes a large amount of money and they give a little bit back to the makers of the music, the ones, the few, the influencers so-called, they pick them. Well, that's, that's not an economy, that's, that's a broken system. Okay, so anyway, I've been working with this fellow here, his name's Steve Stout, who's a brilliant entrepreneur um, who had this vision of creating a two-way market for music. And on, on one side of the market, it's really pretty straightforward. It's just statistics. You have a dashboard, you know, if Peter is, is a musician, you don't know that, but he is. Uh, on the weekends, he makes really amazing hip hop music. And if they, it, every week he gets to see a dashboard and he sees that, uh, you know, in uh, Lyon, he's actually very popular. You know, 10,000 people listened to his songs last week. So he, he tells the venue owners in Lyon that I'm popular there. Why don't you invite me, give a show? They do, because they see the same data he does. He goes there and he makes 20,000 euros. If he does that three times a year, that's a salary and he can forget this professor job. <laughs> okay. So anyway, this was Steve's vision and I've helped execute it because behind this is huge data analysis, but especially it's a two-way market. So it's not just data analysis, it's a two-way market. So this has been created as a company called United Masters and currently there are 2 million young musicians on United Masters who've signed a contract with United Masters. Their music's not being just sent to people randomly, it's being sent, for example, to the National Basketball Association website. Their music is now coming from this site. And every time you go to the NBA website and you hear some music, there's a musician who just got paid. And these kids are now making a salary at the scale of about 2 million. All right, so this is something statistics can do is create new markets and create new salaries and new jobs for people. And that's 2 million in the United States. It could be, you know, 2 million in Africa, 2 million in Brazil, 2 million in Europe and so on and so forth, okay? And it doesn't just have to be music. It could be information flow. It could be art. It could be other kinds of services that people can offer between each other, All right? So I encourage you as young statisticians, especially to think, these are the kind of things we can do. We can partner with people, we can add, we can think about the problem. We can try to build a system that we know will work over a long time scale and so forth. Okay, so um, that's where I was maybe five or 10 years ago. And I just, just decided the last part of my career is gonna be economics speed statistics in the context of mechanism design, which is a more of a kind of computing side of economics. And so here are some of the problems that um, I've been working on with my group. Um, I don't want to go through the list here, but you hopefully see some words that are familiar, things like uncertainty quantification is critical here. It's not just about optima, like we often talk about in statistics and dynamics, it's about equilibria as well and relationships among those things. The mathematics there is quite interesting and, and um, familiar to, to many of you. Uh, it's about bringing uh, recommendation systems together with markets. It's about contracts and experiments. I'm going to get to that in the, in the talk somewhere, and especially about things like incentives. If you don't talk the language of incentives, you put a system out in the real world, it's often gonna fail, okay? And so we need to learn how to talk the language of incentives. Okay, so for the rest of my talk, I will be giving you some little vignettes of research projects in my group. Uh, all of these are on the archive and um, um, details are to be found there. Every one of them has theorems and often they're if and only if theorems. So this is real theoretical research. Uh, it is led to algorithms and some of which are being deployed. But really I want to emphasize that this is kind of a, you know, for academics, I think a, a playground that I, I want to invite many of you to come into. So it's going to often have this economics meets game, you know, so game theory economics meets statistics and hopefully in a somewhat deep sense, not just a trivial blending. There's kind of a fundamental problem that, that brings in um, the two styles of thinking. So those are my four little vignettes. And I'll go relatively quickly because again, details are in papers and this is a Friday and it's late. So I don't want to spend too much time on technical details, but I want to convey the ideas. Uh, so the first one I'm going to do is, is on strategic classification. This is with Tiana, who's a student with me at Berkeley, and Eric, who was a student who's now faculty at Caltech. Uh, classification, that's what we know and love. 
what's it mean to be strategic classification? All right, well, this is just the, 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 the core straightforward problem in which there is a, um, uh, a desire to have a, a, to build a model based on some data, but the data is being possessed, held by strategic agents. And these strategic agents have a, a vested interest in the outcome of this model. So for example, you want health insurance, you have to fill out a form and the health insurance company is going to vet how healthy you seem and then give you a rate based on that. Now, you know, they're doing that. So you're going to, when you fill out the form, you're going to cheat a little bit. You're going to, you know, move things around a bit. I'm not 40 years old, I'm 35 or whatever. Now, of course, the, the insurance company knows that you're going to do this. So they ask questions that are a little bit harder to cheat on. Okay. Um, now, so for example, they might say, would you be willing for a day for us to have access to your cell phone and we'll measure the accelerometer and see how much movement you're going for as a surrogate for how much exercise you do? You sit in your couch all day or do you move around? And as soon as that was happened, I was in Italy at the time, this was during the pandemic, uh, we found that someone in Italy had built a device that you put your cell phone in and it moves it around and simulates a day of walking. <laughs> all right, so is this cheating? Yeah, it's cheating, but is this the real world? Yeah, this is the real world. And, and this is what you have to think about when, uh, so it's really a game between you and the data providers. And if you don't think about that game and what its equilibria are, you're gonna build a system that just won't work. Okay, so let's think about that. Now, of course, this is very familiar to economists. They call this Goodhart's Law. Um, if you, for example, have a poverty index score that was designed in some era, 1994, it looks nice and Gaussian, they designed it well. By uh, you know, 2003, it's shifted over to the left and it's because people are blind. They're making themselves look more poor than they are so they can get more benefits. Okay, so the general setting is that we have these feedback loops when we're doing statistics. Um, we're collecting data, but it's strategic data. And it's going into a decision maker who wants to build a predictive model. So for example, loans in banks. The bank wants to make a model to predict who's going to default, okay? And so they build a model and then they tell the users that you're, we're building a model. The users will then provide data into that and that will update the model. Now, everybody knows this is a game, right? And so, so um, you know, uh, what are they gonna do here? Well, the, you know, these users are gonna move their data in some way, in what way? Well, they will have to know something about the model. So maybe for regulatory reasons or for good business practice, the decision maker says, well, I'll tell you what kind of model I'm using. It's logistic regression. Okay, and that's enough information for the agents then to shade their data a little bit, all right? So there is a game here, and in economics, this is called a Stackelberg. <laughs> Stackelberg games are not like Nash games, which are sit simultaneous. Stackelberg games are sequential. Somebody acts and someone else acts. And it's very interesting, the Stackelberg dynamics, who's the leader, who's the follower? You get different outcomes in the two cases. Sometimes it's better to be the leader, sometimes it's better to be the follower, it depends. These are special kind of Stackelberg games. So these are statistical Stackelberg games in which the goal is to build a model. And the model <coughs> is the best response. You need the water. The model is the best response of the decision maker to the data. And the data is the best response of the agents to the model. And now you want to ask what equilibria do we arrive at in this game for certain classes of statistical models? So it's not an arbitrary Stackelberg game. Okay, now classically, and there's been a little literature on this for five years, and this is actually being deployed in lots of companies without thinking about what they're doing really, but it's known that if the decision maker is the leader, that's good for the decision maker in these particular kinds of games, okay? And it's pretty bad for the strategic agents. And so Google or whoever is building these things is kind of okay with that, all right? But it's known, it's, a, it's just a fact mathematically that it's, it's a problem. And it's being analyzed in this kind of setting where there's a synchronization of the model building and the data provided, okay? And um, the, the leading means that you just have a little bit of a, there, there's a, first of all, a choice of a model, and then there's the data, model data, okay? Um, so we thought, well, that's fine, but you know, in real life, there's not necessarily gonna be a linked set of time scales. These are very distributed systems worldwide or whatever. There's no reason they should be all linked. And, and one of them might be responding faster than the other. And so we should look at different dynamics here, see what kind of equilibrium we get. So here's one where the strategic agents are responding very quickly and the decision maker is updating slowly. And you can imagine the other way as well. All right, so here's that model. And you can ask, is this a realistic model of any situation in the real life? And yeah, it is. For example, college admissions or credit scoring the central decision maker of the university is not gonna change their model every after every you know application has come in. They're gonna hold it fixed for a couple of years, let people adjust to that, 
And you know, that's, that makes a lot of sense sociologically. And similarly with something like credit scoring. So this is actually a model that's out there as well. Um, uh, but then of course, there's the other one, which is the decentral decision maker is updating very, very quickly after each data point they update. And this is more like Google, you know, YouTube, when they're, um, you know, taking in data from people, well, they will update their model immediately, okay? All right, so um, one can analyze these things as Stackelberg gains uh, that are based on statistical models as the best response on one side, and then sampling of data on the other side. Uh, and so we proved a couple of theorems here. One is kind of rather straightforward. It's just that there are equilibria with either order of play. There are different equilibria, and they are, they are, there are equilibria. But the more interesting result is this one, which is that it turns out that in these statistical settings, in particular for generalized linear models, um, both players prefer the equilibrium where the strategic agents lead and the decision maker follows. That's surprising, all right? We, we, we know the strategic agents will probably be more happy when they lead because they're doing badly in the other case. But it turns out the decision, central decision maker is also happier in this situation. That's game theory. Game theory can make it, you know, things a little bit, uh, you know, surprising. Um, but this is actually a new theorem in game theory. Okay, it's not true for general Stackelberg games, but it's true for a specific class of Stackelberg games, which are statistical Stackelberg games. Okay, um, I'm gonna cut that little line of research off. It, it's, it's ongoing, there's lots to do here. Um, you know, there's been huge amounts of work uh, in algorithm and game theory on kind of Nash equilibria meets, uh, you know, um, decision-making and data, but not so much on Stackelberg. And I, I would argue that Stackelberg is much more of the realistic one in real life. Okay, so vignette number two. Um, this returns back to the kind of restaurant matching kind of problems I talked about. If you look at microeconomics, one of the big problems is matching. I got producers and consumers and I wanna find a matching where everybody's kind of happy, all right? In real world problems though, you um, don't know a priori what the preferences are. And that's kind of means you can't use standard microeconomic theory. They assume you know the preferences a priori, okay? So does that seem familiar? Yeah, because that's like a, Bandit problem. I, I have a bunch of options to choose from. You know, the, the, the you know, I'm, I'm a consumer. There's producers. I like to match to one of them, and I have preferences, but I don't know the preferences are pretty. I've got to try them out. It's a it's a bandit problem. So what if we bring bandits together with matching markets? And let me just my students were Lydia Liu and Horia Manny working with me on this. Um, so you all know what multi arm bandits are. We have unknown reward distributions associated with this. We'd like to maximize our mean reward. So we sample, try things out. And um, you know, there are algorithms in particular, the upper confidence bound algorithm that provably work well in this kind of domain. They form a confidence interval on the mean reward for each of the arms. And then they take the upper confidence bound to determine which arm to select next. And I presumably all of you know that, that why you do that. You know, either that upper confidence bound is high because it's a good arm, the whole distribution shifted over to the right. So you should select it for exploitation reasons, you're getting a high reward, or it's high because there's a big confidence interval and you're very uncertain. So you should sample it so you can reduce your uncertainty, decide whether it's actually a good arm or a bad arm, okay? So both reasons, it's a good idea. And provably, this uh, procedure has logarithmic regret. Uh, regret is, of course, measured relative to some oracle. Here, the oracle is someone who knows the optimal arm a priori and just picks that all the time. And you would like to do well relative to that. And this algorithm is logarithmic relative to that, which is, turns out to be optimal. Okay, so that's the classical literature on multi-arm bandits. There's a classical literature, of course, on matching markets, Gale and Shapley, there are Nobel prizes for this. You have buyers and sellers. Um, you assume that preferences are known a priori, that you know, a certain buyer has certain preferences for the sellers, and that's true for everybody. And you then structure the two-way market as a matching and their algorithms, um, for example, the deferred acceptance algorithm, that find a matching which has nice properties. In particular, it's stable. And stable means there's not one buyer and one seller who would prefer to be matched to each other than their current match in the matching. So, and, and this has a kind of a real world flavor to it. You know, if uh, two people want to be matched together and they're not matched, they'll look at each other and they'll, they'll consummate the match and they'll leave their current partner. So that the matching was not stable. And once you arrive at a stable match, no one's incentivized to do that. And hopefully that will predict what matches really arise. All right, again, wonderful field, you know, kidney exchanges, college admissions and so on, we're based on this, it, it's real world, um, but it's not statistical at all. You're assuming all the preferences are known a priori, okay? So what if we bring these two ideas together? Well, now we're gonna have several agents who are trying to figure out what um, arm they prefer, but they're having to do it in the context of matching. 
and only one of them could be matched to the other side of the market. That's our scarcity assumption. All right, so particular when both the human and the bear are playing uh, the bandit game and both of them pick the same arm, in our model, only one of them is getting a reward and the other gets no reward. So let's suppose here the bear gets a reward and the human gets no reward. Why did the bear get the reward? Well, because arm two prefers the bear for some reason. The, the arms are also learning their preferences as well. Okay, so the human looks at that and they say, oh my goodness, I see, I, I like arm two. It looks good for me in terms of being reward. But when I pick it, the bear also seems to like it and the bear wins. So I better explore some of the other arms more than I otherwise would. All right, and that language is that suggests you'll have higher regret when there's competition in the market. And so it's now our job as mathematicians to figure out how much higher regret. Does competition cause more regret? Is it, is it have to? You know, what can we do? What's the best you can do? And so on and so forth. So I hope you see there's a whole raft of little papers that can be written there. And we've written at least part of that raft of papers. Um, let me just uh, tell you one of the results. Uh, you have to define regret. And that means you have to talk about the Oracle. And here our Oracle is um, uh, the Gale Shapley algorithm where you assume you know the known preferences a priori. Okay, so that's a, we call that the stable regret, regret relative to that. Can we be logarithmic relative to that? Or is that impossible? Open problem. All right, so we worked on it and um, um, there's a particular algorithm we analyzed. I'm gonna skip that detail. Um, and we're able to prove for the algorithm that it has logarithmic regret, okay? So it turns out that you don't lose in terms of the regret, the uh, asymptotics of the regret by having competition in the market. Where you lose is only in a constant term. So that delta squared is a measure of the overlap or the gap between the smallest gap between um, reward probabilities, uh, mean rewards for all across all the arms. Okay, so if you have high overlap, like I suggested earlier, uh, that means you have high conflict, and that means that could have you got more regret. You have to explore some of the other arms more than you otherwise would. So it is coming out, but it's in that constant term. With if it's small, it raises the regret by a constant term, but it's still logarithmic. So we're really able still to learn in these markets with um, um, with competition. And this only gets better as the market gets larger. So that's another beauty of a lot of these market systems. They're kind of decentralized and they can actually do better as you get larger. Um, all right, now I'm not gonna show you the proof of that. Um, there is a proof, uh, it's in that paper, it's self-contained, but there's a better proof me method, proof style for that. And in this follow-up paper with uh, Mina, Alex, Xixing, and, and Jacob at Berkeley, uh, we went to a more broad class of matching markets and we talked about learning equilibria in general, okay? So I think of this as somewhat of a general framework. Um, we are interested in these large scale matching platforms. And here we're gonna do the more general economic situation of transferable utilities, okay? So uh, that means that the producer uh, consumer relationship, there's a payment made between the two of them. Okay, so this is more like Uber. If I, if I think of Uber as a large scale transportation system for a city, I've got riders and drivers, a rider gets matched to a driver and the rider pays the driver. And there's a agreed upon price that's part of the market settling, okay? Whereas in a kidney exchange market, you don't pay for the kidney. It's just a stable matching, okay? Two different kinds of things. This is more powerful. This is known as the shapley schubert model. Uh, they're both kind of linear programs of a certain time, but this, and this was subsumes the previous one. All right, so we wanted to analyze this and talk about its equilibria. And in the economics literature, they talk about the equilibria, but they, use the, they have this notion of stability. I and mean, it's a little different here, but it's still stability. And you're either stable or you're not. So it's a kind of binary thing. So like in probability, you're either independent or you're not, right? But just like in probability and statistics, we often want to have a quantitative notion of how stable you are or how independent are you. So mutual information would help us with independence. So we wanted a kind of a, a similar quantity here of saying, well, we're not stable, but you're close to stability. And we'd like to make this be differentiable so we can go downhill and make ourselves more stable. And that, then we can start to bring statistical techniques to bear. Okay, so we've developed such a measure in this paper. Um, and uh, here it is, I've written it out. I'm not gonna explain it, it's in the paper, but it's got utilities and matchings in it. And it's got tau A is the transfers. So it's kind of a difference between something with a transfer and without, and it's a maximum over all subsets of the agents. So if you're an economist, this looks pretty familiar. This looks like the BCG mechanism or it looks like a Shapley index. It's not unfamiliar, okay? Mm -hmm. It kind of compares, a, it's a what if experiment. What if I did this versus this? And what if I do that over all collections of things? All right, so we have a if and only proof that this thing actually does what I claimed it does. If you don't have that outer maximum there, for example, it doesn't work, okay? Um, and if you take the dual of this problem, you have a very nice economic interpretation. 
this measure of stability is the minimum amount that an outside agent could do, could um, subsidize the entire system so that you arrive at stability. Okay, so if you're very unstable, the outside agent's got to pump, pump in a lot of money to the system to arrive at stability. If you're near stability, they have to pump in very little money. So that's a quantitative measure that has an economic interpretation, right? And, and so if you're like you're used to numerical linear algebra or topology, you know for how far you are from singularity. It's kind of measured by how much you have to change something to arrive at singularity. It's a very common idea. Anyway, we have a quantitative notion and we can do proofs with this. And in fact, we can go back to our previous bandit market and get that logarithm to regret with this, with, this, with this proof technique. So this is a Lyapunov function for matching markets with statistics. All right, so I think it's, it's a building block for, for lots of other work. Um, all right, so let me close that little vignette. And I think I'm gonna finish with this last vignette. This is very hot off the press work. Um, how many of you know what contract theory is? Just to sort of see what my audience is here. Yeah, nobody, it's, it's, yeah, it's kind of amazing. How many of you know what auctions are? Yeah, so everyone knows what auctions are. If you're an economist, contract theory and auctions are the two most important topics in mechanism design. They're equally important, okay? So when I tell my economist friends working on contract theory, they say, oh my God, that takes me back to grad school. Yeah, so, all right, so um, first of all, this was with Stephen and Michael and Jake. Stephen and Jake were working with me at Berkeley and Michael's at, at uh, Stanford. Um, Okay, so I hope this will, I think this is the most interesting part of the talk, just so wake back, wake back, back up if you're not awake. Um, all right, so this is situations where we have agents who possess data that they're not willing to reveal. <laughs> Pretty common in lots of real life problems, okay? And we have a principal that's trying to get something done in this kind of set. And they can't just say, give me your data. So I know how to design something optimal if you give me your data, okay? All right, so the setting we've been working this out in is one where, well, the general setting was there's a principal and there might be one or more agents. The principal only has partial knowledge. Some, some private information is produced by, is possessed by the agents. We need to incentivize the agents to get something to be done, uh, but the agents are strategic and self-interested. All right, so our setting is, uh, is the FDA, the Federal Drug Administration, is trying to decide what drugs go to market, All right? And they're gonna have to engage in a clinical trial. It's gonna cost them a lot of money. They'll do it, but they kind of want to be reassured that they're doing it and they're getting out good answers. They're mostly giving good drugs to the market and bad drugs are being suppressed. The strategic agents on their hand are the ones who are the drug companies. They've made the drug and they probably know a little bit internally about how good the drug is going to be. Now they didn't do a huge clinical trial, so they don't really know, but they did a little testing and they kind of designed it in some way. They have some knowledge. They're not going to just tell the FDA that knowledge, right? What they're gonna do is they're gonna put their drug out to the FDA, the FDA is gonna then test it, and this is statistics. There's gonna be a chance of a false positive. Probably a pretty good chance of a false positive. If there's a false positive, then they get to go to market and make a billion dollars. Now, if it's a damaging drug, that would be bad and that would be unethical. But if it's just a drug that's like you know, palliative, it doesn't hurt anybody, maybe they would do it for a while, then some other drug will replace it and they'll have made a lot of money. This happens all the time. All right, so um, contract theory is the discipline in economics that tries to face problems like this, with, but with no statistical side to it. So here's a classical contract theory example. Perfect, perfect. I can even slow down a little. Which is hard for me. I'm, I'm not a slow down type person. <laughs> so here's the classical example of contract theory that if you do take a class in economics, you'll learn about. Um, when you go on the airline, why is there not just one fixed price for a seat in the airline? Everybody's getting the same service, they're getting taken from A to B, right? So, but there's not one fixed price, it's the complete opposite of that. All right, so you probably all thought about this a little bit. Um, you know, what if I set a fixed price, you know, of 100 euros, um, right? There's gonna be some people that just, that too much for them. You know, they, they would spend 80 euros on that trip, but they're not gonna spend 100. So they just will not come. There's some other people who would spend more than 100 euros happily. They'll go ahead and buy the ticket for 100 euros and be happy. Now the airplane will not be full. And moreover, the airline just lost a lot of money. They could have charged some people more. But if they raise the price, it's only getting worse. All right, so what's the answer? You all know what it is. It's a form of price discrimination, but price discrimination is illegal. If I look at you and say, I'm gonna give you a certain price and look at you, I'm gonna give you a different price, that's illegal. So what do they do instead? They say, okay, there's this thing called business class. 
And in business class, you get to have a little shorter line and you get to have a little stupid drink and you can pay 100 euros more for that. And you think a lot of people say, no way, but a lot of people say, yeah, that's great. <laughs> now for the younger audience here, they think that's inexplicable. The older people are sitting there, yeah, of course. Okay, <laughs> All right. And that is just true of real life in many situations. So you put up these two different prices and they're associated with different services. So it's not price discrimination in the classical sense. And what happens then? Well, the lower people say, oh, there's an 80 euro price, it's cheap. I get no service, I don't give a damn about services, I'll buy those. So they fill up half the plane. And there's some other people that say, oh, 200 euros for an extra little glass of um, berry juice, great. They pay that and you get both kinds of people and you fill the plane and the overall income is higher. All right, so you can make mathematics out of this and that's what books on contract theory do. And it's really interesting mathematics. Just to say. It's not familiar as nearly as like auctions and equilibrium markets and all that's very familiar, but this mathematics is a little different. So it's pretty interesting. Um, anyway, this, this works in real life all the time and there's much more income being made, more social welfare or everything. It's kind of the good things that economists hope for with contract theory. All right, so our goal was to bring contract theory together with Neyman Pearson because the contract people just think about prices and airplanes and money. We thought about, well, what about testing, like FDA? All right, so I hope you all know about clinical trials. Um, and I hope you also know that huge amounts, these are millions of dollars over there on real clinical trials that have been done in 2014, for example. So vast investment in, so in clinical trials. And the goal here is just to make good decisions, right? But there is an adversarial side to this that's often not talked about, okay? The people, the drug companies are adversaries here. They don't want to entirely be honest, okay? They don't even know. They're not sure their drug is good or bad. They don't know. So they're just trying to play the game. Okay, so if you go in as a statistician, uh, you say, okay, well, I can do this. This is Damon Pearson. There, there's bad drugs. Bad means kind of ineffective. Let's not say it's going to hurt people, but it's just ineffective. And there's good drugs. And let's do a, you know, probability of type one error, 0 0.05, you know, power of 0.8. Let's set it up in our usual way. And the question is, is that a good protocol or should we be using some other numbers, right? Well, without any kind of economic thinking, it's, you know, there's, a, there's no, you know, there's just an argument, right? But if you put some economic thinking in, you'll see what happens. So suppose that um, you have to pay $20 million to run a clinical trial here, which might be kind of typical. And if you're approved, um, you make $200 million in profit, okay? Right? If you'll just now do the calculation, the expected value of profit, given that it's a bad drug, is minus 10 million. Right? And so everybody can do that calculation, and the agents will do that calculation. And they'll say, I see, uh, to play the game, it costs me 20 million. My expected is minus 10. I'm not going to play the game. If they have a conditioning on, they have a bad drug. Okay? So this, uh, most of the approvals will be good drugs. Okay? So there's, a, there's a complementary power kind of notion here. If you have a good drug, you're going to have positive income. On the other hand, if it costs you $20 million to play, but you make $2 billion off your drug, which is also a realistic number, then the expected profit, even if you have a bad drug, is 80 million. And so you're gonna throw your drugs, as many drugs as you can into the game and hope for some false positives. Okay, so how do you fix this? All right, so this is not just statistics, uh, I'm arguing, right? It's not, and so it's incentives. Um, so you bring contract theory together with statistics. Okay, and so let me just set up the problem a little bit. We have the paper, you can read the details. Um, but basically here is the, here's the protocol. So denote the agent's private information as theta. And then there's a little protocol that the agent can opt into or decide not to play the game. If they opt in, they first of all have to pay an amount R, the pay to play amount, right? Then they get to choose a payout function F from a menu of payout functions. That's called a contract. It's a little list. Business class, certain fair. Econ economy class is another fair, right? Here it's gonna be things like how much data you gather and how much you make, okay? Um, uh, so F is just a mapping from some outcome Z, which is drawn from a distribution indexed by theta. So if it's a bad drug, then you're gonna observe some, you know, how long people live or whatever, and you're gonna, you're gonna get a value Z, all right? Then you're gonna threshold that to make a name and person decision. Okay, so Z is uh, the statistic and it's conditioned of course on theta, all right? And so now after you've done all that, the agent then receives a payoff given by their selected choice from the menu at little f and based on the uh, outcome of the measurement. If, if the drugs, if it's you get a big Z value, that's good. The drug is approved and you make a lot of money, okay? Uh, but the principal on the other hand, he receives a real utility 
which is based on how good the drug actually is and how much they had to pay. Okay. And of course, the overall social welfare is the sum of these two. All right, so our, our job is to, to design menus. Can we design menus that have got good statistical properties and economic properties? All right, so first of all, we have to have some notion of incentives. If you don't talk about incentives, you're not doing the economic side. So in particular, for the bad agents, uh, the, the utility of the principle for a bad agent or a bad drug uh, should be negative, and it should be decreasing in this observed um, you know, payout the payout based, the random payout, okay? And the flip of that is for the good null agents, their utility, the, sorry, the utility of the principal should be positive. Utility should be happy to, to let the good, the good agents come in and it should be increasing in this um, observed statistic, all right? Given that the principal wants to transact as much as possible with good agents, they want to design an incentive aligned contract. And all that means is that if you have a bad agent, your condition on P theta naught, the expectation of the amount you're gonna pay the agent minus the amount they had to pay to play is negative, okay? If that's set up, then you're pretty happy with your contract, okay? The, the bad agents are not incentivized to play the game. They might play it anyway or whatever, there's still some probabilities here, but they're not incentivized to play the game. Okay, so null agents are incentivized to drop out. That would be a, a good way to design a contract. Now, question is, can we turn this into statistics in this setting of Neyman Pearson? All right, and it turns out that yes, you can. And you, but the, the answer is to use E values. Uh, I'm sure all of you know what E values are. They're kind of like P values, but not quite. Um, a random variable is an E value uh, for the null hypothesis if under the null hypothesis, the expectation is less than or equal to one. And what we've been able to prove is that a contract is incentive aligned. So that's a notion from economics, if and only if all payout, payout functions are E values. All right, so we've made a match between an economic concept of incentive aligned and a statistical concept of being an E-value. It has certain statistical properties associated with it. And those properties are actually bleeding over on both sides, if and only if, okay? So now we can really do a Neyman Pearson style theory, all right? We can say, how should a principal design a menu? Okay, well, now let's admit the fact that we don't know the true theta. So let's imagine we put a prior distribution on theta, Q, and now the principal's utility on average over, over theta would be the previous utility, but now averaged over theta. And now we can define a notion of maxi min optimality. You wanna find the contract that maximizes the smallest, uh, the infimum over this distribution of the, of the utility. All right now the F being chosen up there is the best response F, which is coming from the agent. So the agent is responding based on this menu and choosing what for them looks the best. All right. And another theorem, our second theorem is that a, a menu is maxi min if and only if uh, the, the contracts, the set of these payout functions are all contained in these incentive compatible set, all right? So from the pre, you put the two theorems together, uh, this says that uh, you have a maxi min procedure if and only if your set of contracts are all E values, okay? Moreover, it's not hard to see that larger menus, that was kind of on the protect yourself against bad agents, but on the more power side, can you find the good agents? It's, it's easy to see that larger menus will help the non old agents. So actually the optimal contract to design is a set of all E values. Now you may not want to use that in practice for computational reasons or complexity reasons, um, but that would be the, that is the optimal contract. Okay, so I'm gonna skip this next section. Um, I'm gonna finish up here with one more slide. Uh, there was another section I didn't have time for, but um, this is on the other side of mechanism design theory, contract theory, and then auctions. And in auctions, it's also, there's, there's hidden information. You're trying to get a good outcome despite that. And uh, you collect information from people. Uh, and there's now finally a literature on doing that more statistically. You have repeated auctions and you learn from them. And now the problem is there's a big robustness problem. People have tried this in real life. And what happens is a few bad agents come in and throw in random data or crappy data to ruin the auction. And they do that because they hope there'll be a big opportunity later to get a, something for a cheap price. All right, so we brought in basically robustness theory from statistics into auction theory and found the way to design new Meyerson auctions, which are, and let me again recognize co-authors here, uh, Wen Shulgo and Manolis working with me at Berkeley, uh, a way to design optimal auctions with, a, um, with provable guarantees on how much revenue you get and how much computational complexity or, or statistical complexity you have to pay to do that. So I'm gonna skip that part of the talk. Um, okay, so la last two slides. So I already had that slide up there and hopefully I've given a little substance to that little diagram there. Um, I think that all students should be kind of aware they should be in the middle here somewhere. And 
each side of this really needs to be aware of the third missing leg, okay? Because really you will not design good systems in real life and you will rightly be criticized if you do, unless you really think about all three together. And here's the last slide, which is that my bigger, that was kind of an academic perspective, but, but the bigger perspective I wanna convey here is that I finally figured out what this whole thing of machine learning is after 40 years, okay? Machine learning is not a new field. I think you in this room probably know that. It's just inferential ideas from statistics meets algorithmic ideas from computer science. Nothing new. Deepening, but nothing new, fundamentally. All right, so what is it? All right, well, what happened was the computer scientists came in and they had been used to programming computers. They weren't very good at statistics. They kind of started to learn a little bit. And they said, well, we can make this automatic. We can run these at scale. We can do all this stuff and we'll call that machine learning. And machines can now learn out in the real world and they can you know, make decisions and do all these kind of things. So that's an engineering mindset. They're trying to build systems that kind of do stuff in the real world. Statisticians very, very rarely have had an engineering mindset. We're either mathematicians, we want to prove the theorems, or we're helping the scientists discover things, okay? So there was this missing thing. And I think this is exactly what happened. It's in the 40s and 50s, chemical engineering arose. In the 20s and 30s, there was nothing called chemical engineering. There was chemistry, there was quantum mechanics. So you knew what happened when you put molecules together in test tube. But then some crazy people said, what if we build factories out in a, in a field and we use the same kind of ideas, but we design brand new scale thermodynamic systems? Uh, and will that work? And you had to develop new mathematics to do that. That became called chemical engineering, but, but people just tried it out anyway. And sometimes it worked, but often it, the, the factory exploded or just didn't work. It didn't deliver chlorine or whatever, it just didn't work. And over 20 years, it got worked out and there was an engineering discipline that used chemistry principles. Same thing with electro, uh, you know, electrical engineering. Um, before electrical engineering around 1900, there was Maxwell's equations already. So everyone knew everything about the electromagnetism there was to know, right? But this new field called electrical engineering had to emerge so you could electrify a city or put you know, a, a electricity in someone's home and not make the home burn down or design circuits or whatever. And that field arose, it became called electrical engineering and it had its own mathematics and its own principles. I would suggest that we have a missing field of statistics as an engineering discipline of designing transportation systems, finance systems, commerce systems, healthcare systems, and all that. And if we simply approach those as science problems, where we're trying to discover the truth, we're not going to design the working systems. All right? And if we don't do that, we're letting the machine learning people who are ignorant of vast parts of statistics design those systems. And that's what's been happening. Okay? So either way, if you want to embrace machine learning or not, don't treat it as just a different kind of non-parametric regression or a you know, competing methodology or a different style of analysis. Treat it as a big, large scale, planetary scale, really, engineering discipline that is fundamentally about statistics. And personally, I think, engage with them. Um, now, the main part of the talk, of course, is if you're gonna do that, you better also become an economist. So thank you. How do economists receive it? Yeah, I, I get this. They, many of them very well, first of all. I've been invited to uh, various economics conferences. I'm doing a keynote at the uh, a big economics conference this summer, last summer at the Game Theory Conference. So that's really great. Uh, but they all tell me that 10 years ago, we would have hated you and it would have kicked you out of the room. But we've woken up. We see there's data everywhere. We see we've been missing that. And we don't think we can do it all by ourselves. So I, I, I really, this talk was for the young people in the audience is that be brave and, and bridge fields and go there and they will probably welcome you. You've got real ideas here that they don't have. And economists have lots of differential equations and linear programming and curves that cross and all kinds of heavy mathematics, but they're missing some essential ideas about inference. And you can easily supply those and you can do work that really has a big impact. Let me also just say in the 30s or 40s, it's, none of this is really new. You know, David Blackwell would have totally gotten all this. He says, yeah, I'm an economist and a statistician and a computer scientist. You know, von Neumann would have said the same thing. What's the big point? And somehow we've come, you know, 100 years later where everybody says, well, I'm a statistician or I'm an economist or I'm a computer scientist. Mm -hmm. um, and so the young people in the room return to the era of Blackwell and von Neumann.
Um, so first of all, in the space of a PhD, you're not going to learn everything you need to know. Number one, just be prepared though for a lifetime of learning. I mean, frankly, I knew none of this. I didn't know even any statistics when I was 30 years old, or whatever. Um, but I keep textbooks next to my bed every night, and I sit in on classes and I watch YouTube videos still to this day. And in the last five years, I've learned a whole lot of economics, economics, and I've had a great time doing it. And the cool thing is, of course, I know all the mathematics. I know the stochastic process and the optimization theory that I was in. So I just plow through the book like a novel. It's way more fun than it would have been when I was 25. Okay. So I, I mean, I suppose that's the best message. And the other one is, you know, these new, we have new curricula in data science and all where we throw out some of the asymptotics, we do the bootstrap, we throw out a lot of the baggage that was good for another year in statistics. And we focus on a few things that actually do merge well the other fields. And economists need to learn how to do that. Some of them are doing that. There's books on mechanism design and contract theory that are really beautiful and fun to read. They're not full economic general equilibrium theory and blah, blah, blah. And then the computer scientists, you know, also the, some of them, you know, it's not that hard to learn some of the basic. Um, I, optimization is really what computer science is about. And there's some really great books on optimization. Um, so I hope that was helpful. But yeah, just really, if you want to be in any of these fields that make a difference, it's going to take a career. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's probably one for a longer style of beer. We could grab a beer and talk about it, but um, absolutely engaging the real world is, the, is really the right answer. You can go talk to your economist friends and write some papers, but this is really about going out in the real world. And either as a professor and going having partnerships or working in some companies that do these things for a while. And, you know, think about even statistics like the days of Bell Labs or whatever. There was a lot of statisticians working in Bell Labs, getting in their heads into real world problems. Think about von Neumann, you know, real world problems. Think about the mathematicians that were doing these things. So, you know, I spend a day a week at Amazon and I don't know if I'm helping Amazon all that much, but I've, I've ingested some of this. I worked at Alibaba for a while in China or spent some time there. And so, some of this definitely is, is coming from seeing what they're working on and how, how interesting and hard it is. And think about what this effect is on real world humans. Because often we don't think about that at all. We, we talk about ethics because we should add some ethics to our curriculum. But really we're building systems that are directly interfacing with human beings. We're not like just the chemists who are you know, somewhat indirectly, it's directly doing it. Uh, so beyond the real world, you can start to see, okay, those are the real problems and those are not. And in fact, economists are often sort of saying the naive thing to do here would be that. And the incentive way of thinking would do this and it's way better. And we need to get, ingest a little bit of that. You only get that by practice in the real world, trying out mentally this kind of path versus this. Um, so, yeah, I mean, statistics is fundamentally not just mathematics, right? It's a, we learn, all learn mathematics so we learn other things. But statistics is fundamentally about solving real world problems. And I'm just adding to the list. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for the nice talk, Mike. I like your triangle diagram, and so sometimes people talk about like the trade-off between complex yeah. and simple estimation. Yeah. I wonder if you see any other trade-offs between the other. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, great question. Um, yeah, so um, this talk was aiming at sort of not getting into that, but that's really what I do in real life. I write down equations that have got log n to the m power divided by this, divided by this, and then those are trade-offs. And some of those quantities are complexity theoretic, some of them are statistical, some of them are computational, some of them are economic. And every one of these papers has got at least two of those in there. There's not just one. Um, so indeed, the, it's all about the trade-offs. It's all about the quantitative trade-offs, the rules of thumb that a real engineer would use encapsulated in some nice little equation. And there's often gonna be a square root of n sitting there and that's a statistician's contribution often. Um, but there's also gonna be a little term that's, that's kind of the, the moral hazard that you have to pay this cost here because you can't get the data directly. That's the economist's contribution. They can quantify that, okay? And then the computation person can say, you know, polynomial time or whatever. Um, and so indeed all the theorems in these papers actually aim at that. And I think that's really what's great about these fields. They do talk about trade-offs, right? And, and bias variance, but the computational people have their trade-offs and the econ people have their trade-offs. And I think the really fun stuff is when you bring the trade-offs together. So think about privacy. This is one where we spent, you know, John Ducci and Martin Wayne, I have a whole series of papers on this. Uh, you can quantify privacy loss with differential privacy, quantitatively. 
And you can trade that off against risk, which is a statistical quantity. And so if you want to have more privacy, your risk will go up and vice versa. So we wrote papers that quantitative trade-offs between differential privacy and risk, all right? And there was some mathematics needed. There's a little bit new, but not all that new. It's a lot of empirical process theory meets stochastic process meets counting. Um, but I do think when you, if you look at contract theory and all this, you'll see some kind of new ways of thinking that are, that'll, that'll lead to new trade-offs that'll be kind of really mathematically pretty interesting. I don't know how to do some of them. In fact, there's a, I can give a whole separate talk on stuff I've tried to do in the last five years and don't know how to do. Yeah, uh, so I like the idea. So that's kind of a joking question. Uh, there are any scarcity? Is there scarcity? Yeah, in this field too. Right? Yeah. Like, we're the whole world. <laughs> this is yeah. yeah no. So you're in an yeah. actual university where there's a fair amount of operations with search meets econ meets statistics and computation. And you see it, I, I'm absolutely sure. Um, but so yeah, a lot of, you take it with a grain of salt, some of the remarks I made about the computer scientists don't know how to do this or this and this. You know, scarcity is present in computer science too, a little bit. It's also present, you know, in statistics, if you kind of look at it from the right point of view. And again, David Blackwell was behind almost all these ideas. And so there's some unification there. But I, I would really want to emphasize the fact that we don't emphasize those things. And we often will design systems not thinking at all about the human side, the incentive side, the scarcity side. Or as statisticians, we design systems and say, oh, it's computationally tractable. And we have no proof of that. And it's not. <laughs> it, you know, it's MCMC will run for who knows how long. And so you can't do it in real life. So someone out there in industry says, I, well, I wish I could do that, but I can't. Um, so, uh, you know, I just think, yeah, the, especially the younger people don't take these promises of that we can, we can handle all that too, too readily. It's good, often, you know, it's not true. I, I do, the, 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 when I spend that one day a week at Amazon, they really work on some cool real world problems. Like how do you price something so that producers and consumers are both happy on some supply chain situation, blah, blah, blah. There's usually about 10 people around the room solving those problems. And there's like three statisticians, three economists, three computer scientists, and one lawyer. <laughs> So thanks, Mike. You already announced my great music. Uh, and I need the help of Chive. Please come on stage here. <laughs> Just, uh, OK, what shall we sing? No, no, no. OK, <laughs> so my enormous thank you. Uh, and all his team for having organized a wonderful conference at a very difficult time. The pre preparation was really much more complex than usual. You did simply a wonderful job. Thank you very much. We should, we should also really thank his whole team. And of course, the success of this conference would not have been possible with all of you. Thank you very much for everybody who came. You made the difference. It has been a wonderful conference. I personally also enjoyed it a lot. Thank you very much. And uh, the IMS annual meeting is closed, but I hope to see many of you tomorrow at the joint IMS call day. Thank you.